<laughs> Don't be so nervous, man. <laughs> hey, you get to go second. I know, you get to John, see how this I'm goes, man. <laughs> this is my one opportunity. <laughs> that's lucky because depending on how bad you nail me, I nail you worse the second no, time. That's cool. Man. <laughs> I can swerve pretty well. <laughs> You're going to oh, end up on a flipping high, but this is going to be a great last episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> episode 80. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, that I think is super honest stuff. You know what I mean? Like maybe mm. we, maybe we, we save a lot of that sort of stuff for around two, like in another 80 episodes. Or okay. Do you Definitely know what I mean? Right. Like, cause we'll be like, you know, through all these conversations over after 160 episodes, we realize there's actually another there's, layer. Whatever. There's another layer of, of our yeah. stories too that we, you know, we feel we need to just talk about and stuff. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. No, I'm excited. To, no, don't be nervous. <laughs> to you. No, but obviously, you know, you have that moment of like, this I don't know you. like how well it's going to be received. Like, I don't know how far, like what I'll say. I don't really know yeah. what you're going to ask. So like, I don't really know what might crop up. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's just the unknown. Uh, you know, you know, you and I kind of like to be a bit prepared with these kind of things. Yeah, of so course. you, so it's like just not. It feels awkward to not know what's coming in a way. That that's, <laughs> I guess the, I get you know, because we're so yeah. prepared usually. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. But it's just been. I yeah. think it's literally the only thing is it's just been on the other side. That's the difference. Yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, but it's good though. I think it's a good exercise. I think it's a great exercise, but yeah, I think, yeah, like, yeah I'm sure it was even nice writing that out. Um, it was good to do. Yeah. Just to yeah. see like more or less yeah. the things that are, have affected my youth, especially, I mean, most mm. of the late stuff, you know, but like before that, I just thought it was good to run through that. So it's a good exercise anyway, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. Great <laughs> guys, how are you, my boy? How's it going, buddy? Yes, I'm epic, my man. How about you? Yeah, bad. I'm really good. Thanks, really good. I am excited to talk to you today. We have uh, something a little bit different, don't we, bud? <laughs> we do. <laughs> uh, it's like uh, I'm sort of excited and nervous at the same time because we're we're always so prepared, uh, and I mean, obviously, you're prepared. But uh, when it's when you're in the hot seat, uh, I, I get a a feeling of the pressures of being behind the mic on this side. So uh, I'm excited to see where you want to go with this today. And uh, I'm excited for all of you out there to get to know me a little bit better. Yeah, I know for sure, but it's really cool. And, and it's actually quite interesting in, in one respect, like, cause now we probably understand what it's like to be a guest on the show as well. You know, like it's not necessary. We're like, we're always calm because we're prepared, but then actually yeah. for guests, <laughs> We can understand why maybe it's a little bit daunting because it kind of is like, okay, w what's going to happen here? So, one hundred percent, it's it's cool in that um, in that regard. So, but yeah, I mean, we're obviously going to interview each other, okay? Because what we've realized over our eighty episodes now, or seventy nine, this is going to be eighty, is that we don't necessarily know each other that well, and that's because of, you know, we've had like quite a few of my mates on the podcast and I found out stuff about them that, that I had never known. And I mean, I've known these guys for like 25 years sort of thing. And uh, we just feel like it's a good opportunity for us to, to get to know each other that extra layer because we only came into each other's lives about six years ago. And there's so much that we don't necessarily know and it's just uh, it's an important exercise for that reason but then also it's an important uh exercise for you guys that are listening because you can get to know a little bit more about who we are and where we've come from hey craig 100 percent, and, and also there's a sort of a third layer is when you have to think about yourself and be interviewed by someone else it, it kind of it makes you realize a few things about yourself and where you come from and the, maybe the patterning or the blueprinting that's occurred in your life when you, when you look at that stuff, you know, and uh, so there's something quite cool about just being on the receiving end as well, because you get to really think about uh, all the, all the things that make you, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And one thing which I, I've just thought of now actually 
you wrote an amazing storyboard for, for me to use that I could, you know, write questions and things like that. And, and I almost feel like you have opened up much more than you probably ever were in the past. And you just like, okay, this is me. I, I might've done some bad things or be shy or embarrassed about some things in my past, but actually this is me. So if you want to know me, then, then here it is, Gareth. Yeah. And um, I, I'm assuming, I just think, I, like I know you pretty flipping well now. And <laughs> I, I don't think you would have probably written all of that stuff before maybe. Is yeah, exactly. Right? 100%. And, and it's also, uh, there's that for sure, but there's a, there's a sneaky layer to that too because I want you to give me all your dirt too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're gonna uh, have to reciprocate now, my man. <laughs> That's fine, man. That's fine. I'm happy to. Share no, but it's it cool, you. you know. Like I think it's really important to to know your buddies. And I mean, um, I, we had Umbulelo on, and and I'm just still like when I listen back to the podcast, I'm just like, wow, we we kind of knew each other, but we totally didn't know each other. And and I'm by the same token as what you were just saying, um, I just want to we want to do this to to get to know people and what, start with the people closest to you. And, uh, and those are the really good ones. And, and how often do you actually sit down with, with your mom or your dad or your grandpa or you, your best mate and really like ask them and just, but, but in a one way, sort of a unilateral discussion of like, you tell me all about your life. Cause generally it's always a, a two way street, but mm. this is quite a different way to do things. And I think maybe it's a cool thing for others to, to do at some stage, almost have an interview with one of your family members or, or whoever it may be. Yeah, really, really important. And, and we've both spoken about this a lot with each other. And we want to go and have these chats with our folks, with our buddies. And, you know, I even look back now, like the guys I grew up with, I'm like, I know you, but I don't really know you. you know? <laughs> I want to find out these details because it will help me understand you better as a person. And I think that's sure. important. Yeah, yeah, no, likewise. <clears throat> yeah, but so flip man, well, we might as well get going, hey, and uh and kick Let's this dive off, in. I think. Um so Kragos, uh we they call you or we call guys like you in South Africa a uh, lot lamaki, <laughs> which <laughs> which effectively means like you're kind of the, the late kid of the family. Um because you have an older brother who's seven years older than you and an older sister. Uh, she's 11 years older than you and you mm. grew up in Port Elizabeth, which is known as the windy city in South Africa um, or the friendly city or but. the friendly city, both of them, I think, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, friendly makes sense, but you're such a friendly. Oak. <laughs> so, but maybe you can take us back to, to your childhood a little bit. And, you know, I know that it wasn't necessarily always hunky dory growing up, was it? Yeah, Gareth, it was a great place. PE is a really interesting place. I've met people from PE wherever I've been in the world, which is the weirdest thing. It's the small place and wherever you go, you'll meet some, someone, you know, from PE. So when you go back, you always know someone of, you know, that knows someone. So, you know, you'll go to the airport and you'll see someone, you go, Oh, I recognize that person. You go, Oh, he's probably, and then like my, my, my wife will say like, Oh yeah, it's probably, probably someone from PE, isn't it? You know, like <laughs> and it happens all the freaking time, which is so, it's so random, but there's something, um, I don't know what it is, but there's something about the Eastern Cape in general in South Africa that has like a good, um, like a friendly connection with one another. There's, they feel almost a little bit separate to some of the other places. And, uh, and PE, I suppose is the center of, of the Eastern Cape vibe. So, um, it's an interesting place. It's like an industrial town. Uh, at the sea and so you got this real mix of like rough around the edges um and then also these beautiful places at, at the beach and surfing and stuff like that so you've got this real mix uh but i had a good childhood overall you know like um we it was a very safe environment uh i would we would build forts you know on the weekends and run around in the streets that typical sort of uh thing you'd maybe imagine when a, in a safe area like um, you know, mom and dad would make sure you were in when the sort of the street lights were coming on, you know, and then you'd come home, have a big dinner, but, uh, or, or set the table probably. And then, and then have dinner, but, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, that, that was the kind of vibe. And, um, you know, generally speaking, I was just 
good mates with all my neighbors, you know, like when I was a kid and, uh, and I'm still friends with actually a number of them, uh, which is pretty cool. That's really cool, man. That's really cool. And it's, it's really hard for me to sort of comprehend it, but you said you're a little bit of a overweight, shy, and uh, a kid that suffered with uh, low self-esteem and confidence. Yeah. So, so I did, um, you know, sometimes ha- growing up in a, in a family that isn't always the most happy environment, like my mom and dad used to, um, fight a lot. Like I'm talking 24 seven, but, wow. and, and, and so I think I, being the youngest, I, I think I, on some level I was protected by my brother and my sister from a lot of it. Um, but on the other end, they ended up leaving home because they were a lot older than me. So I ended up being alone at home mm. and then having to witness the, a lot of that. So I, I think it impacted me um, on some level. And I ended up being, like, as you say, I was quite a, yes, I could eat. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, was, I was like this chubby, this chubby kid. And I, and, and I really didn't, um, I didn't feel good about myself a lot of the time. And I, and I do actually remember that um, feeling, having that feeling uh, like a fair amount of times um, as a youngster. And, um, and, you know, I, I had loving parents that they, they were there, but I think the, there's a, there's a sort of a big difference between actions and then, and what people are saying, do you know what I mean? So, so I would often hear like, you know, we, we love you and things like that from my parents, which is great. I'm, I'm very grateful for having that. But at the same time, like the, the, the connection that my mother and father had, I would look at that and I'd go like, well, that, how can you say this is a loving environment, but it's totally not. So there was a disconnect. And I, and I think I blamed myself on some level for a lot of stuff that, you know, I, I'm, I presume that's quite a common thing for like the young kid to sit back and wonder like, why is this happening? Why, why do I have this family environment? Um, and, uh, and, and then maybe blame yourself and then you go internally and, and then you just, you pack on the pounds and then it just gets, it's a vicious cycle because then you're like, mm. well, now I'm fat, you know what I mean? Um, so some good stuff came out of that though, because I was a decent loose head prop in, uh, <laughs> in school. <laughs> I must say I laughed when I read that. I was like, what? Prop? <laughs> <No chance." laughs> yeah, I was, I was like, you know, when you're a bit dick, you can, uh, you can, you know, I was fairly strong because I had this older brother that had always been, always been like prepping me, you know, like, uh, I'm eternally grateful. I was like stronger than most of my mates at the same age because, um, I would, uh, my brother would ride on my back and have these challenges for me and, and, um, uh, do all these little things to like test me and stuff when I was a kid. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it, 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 it put me in good stead for, for like sport and, and, the, the odd uh, fight and stuff later on at, at school. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting because normally like the props, like you said, they're the big oaks, but they're also the oaks that are the bullies in the school. But uh, <laughs> uh, doesn't sound like you were necessarily a bully. Hey, no, I don't know. I think I had that element to me because I think I would get reactive. Do you know what I mean? Um, so it was, I think sometimes I did have, a, I was my, because my self-confidence was low uh, and I, and I, and I would, um, if someone, yeah, I, I used to like act out, I think as a kid. Um, and, and I don't think I was bullying anyone, but I, I, I wasn't always a nice, nice to other people. And I think the main reason was just because I wasn't nice to myself. And, uh, yeah, that was just, that was just how it turned out. You know what I mean? And, um, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I was scared of, of people fighting and stuff. I was, I was timid, you know, mm. but, but I'd end up also being, um, quick to like get angry with other people when it was in my favor, let's say. So I guess there was an element of having like a, a supposed bully element to me. So yeah, kind of wow, scary. When you so, think back. It's so interesting, like listening, you know, we, I spoke about this before we obviously um, started talking now, but our stories are, are so similar, like on, on so many levels and wow. we literally, uh, you know, we're meant to meet somewhere along the line, I guess. And, and it's very, very fascinating. Well, of course, we'll find out more <laughs> when, you, when you read mine and stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but maybe you can just, let, let's talk a little bit about your folks and your brother and your sister. You know, just tell us a bit about what, what they did, um, where yeah, they came cool. from and you know, what they were like. Of course. Yeah, so, so mom and dad were from Johannesburg um, and, uh, and I was, you know, 
I was con- apparently conceived in Joburg <laughs> and then, but I was born in PE and, um, dad, dad's family was a little rough around the edges. They, they, they grew up or he, he grew up in a place called a Witburki, uh, and it's on the West Rand in, in jo- Joburg. And then, and in those, it's like, a, and then sort of originally from like mining towns. And, uh, so he had quite a rough upbringing. He, for example, his, <laughs> his older brother, used to um, actually go and like pick fights, right? With the other kids in the, in the like streets and then, but then make my dad fight. So, <laughs> so, he, so he would, he would pitch like my dad against other younger brothers, let's say. <laughs> and this is like my dad's up really like this rough, but he ended up going to Kez, which is, which is, um, which is a good school in Johannesburg. And uh, he he actually applied himself. He, he's quite a smart guy, and he started like really applying himself at school and at sport. He was a good rugby player um, and at school and things like that. And and he kind of, you know, you can easily get into a cycle. And and he kind of broke that cycle. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to not grow up in sort of that rough environment um, as as he was born into. And um, both him and my my mom, both of their their parents were like alcoholics and rough and like you know abusive, and I think it's quite a common thing. I'm sure we've spoken about this before, but that that sort of age group in South Africa, I don't know if it's around the world, but there was a lot of that. You know, people had been to the border war, um, and I don't know, there was just a weird. Well, that was later on, but the Second World War, a lot of them, and then um, you know, with those scars, there was a lot of drinking and. Um, and this sort of filtered into my parents and my mom was, uh, was a, a PA, uh, for a long time at Standard Bank and, um, yeah, both, b- both, um, great people, um, but had their failings, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, my sister, my brother, great people as my brother actually lives in, in Australia and that's kind of why I moved here. I wanted to get closer to some family. Um, and, um, he's a civil engineer and he's, he's just a super, I actually call him grandpa because, um, my grandfather's like this super practical guy can build a freaking space rocket and my brother's exactly the same as him. So that's his nickname. (laughs) And, uh, and, and my sister's 11 years old, as you mentioned, and she's, um, she's just a a super wonderful woman and uh, with two uh, great kids um, and, but anyway, she's, she's just like this ultimate, like caring person who has the most incredible knowledge of like music and art and all these, these finer things in life. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I've, I've learned so much from, from both of them. So, including my parents. So yeah, interesting sort of family, but, but not like, um, not like crazy, interesting stories. Like they've, you know, own this massive business or you know it's just sort of a normal i would say middle class like family you know yeah definitely like most of us but i think most of us have just had that sort of normal upbringing which is which is great but but uh yeah. you you told me about some epic holidays that you used to take you used to go to a private <laughs> diamond mining town ta- private diamond <laughs> yeah. mining town called Clancy, and yeah. You were often flown there on like a De Beers private jet, so <laughs> that must be pretty cool, eh? That was epic, man. So my my cousins who are like very close to me, like my brothers, uh, my aunt and uncle are uh, their, their parents, um, are like second parents to me. We, every holiday we'd sort of hang out, and they were in a. So this town is is all the way up north on the west coast of South Africa, um, near the border of uh, um, Namibia, and. Uh, it's near a town called Springbok. And anyway, so I'd get to Cape Town on a bus or something like that usually from PE. And then the, the <laughs> Marion, my aunt, because uh, she was like an exec there at, uh, at De Beers. So she would hook up the, <laughs> the De Beers private jet and I'd get on there and I'd be like, you know, you sit there and you get a Coke out of the, the little, you know, like <laughs> obviously I was drinking Coke at those days, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, no, it was epic. So these holidays were amazing because it's a, a crazy place because it's a, uh, it's a private town. So what that means is it's owned by De Beers mm. and, um, and the diamond mine. So, so basically um, you, you can't just go there. You have, to, it's like very strict, obviously, because there's so many diamonds there. Hmm. 
that you, 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 they x-ray you, for example, if you visit and check that you haven't swallowed some diamonds and stuff. It's crazy. So, wow. <laughs> so anyway, so I'd rock up there and then we'd have these great holidays because it was so, like unbelievably safe. Um, so we would get our bikes and pack some firewood and like snacks and supplies and we'd ride our bikes like miles and we'd go sleep at the beach um, somewhere at this little place randomly um, on our own when we were youngsters. You know, it's actually probably a little crazy in a way thinking about it, but, and we'd have these cool little adventures, you know, just when we were three youngsters, um, uh, the three of us and, you know, great times, great memories. But actually once my aunt, she actually found a, uh, um, a diamond in her shoe, if I remember correctly. Uh, and it was like a raw uncut, obviously uncut diamond. And, and, you know, to you and I, we would have looked at this thing and just thought it was a little stone, you know, <laughs> but she knew. And, uh, uh, anyway, you're not normally actually meant to like touch diamonds. If you see them, you have to like, but she took the thing, handed it in, um, and it was just like a decent sized diamond, but it's, it's pretty crazy, crazy place. And, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, that specific mine is actually sort of, um, closing down now, actually. Wow. That sounds so cool, man. Like, yeah, I just uh, can imagine the memories from there are fond, but, and just, yeah. Uh, yeah, just spending time riding around those beaches by yourself. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, that's so cool, man. So, but what do you think you learned from your folks uh, throughout the years, like both good and bad? Jeez, that's a good question. Um, a few things. So if I have kids one day, you shouldn't, one thing you should definitely try and do is not put your own shit onto your kids. Um, so I, I often felt like I was uh, privy to all of their emotions all the time and how they felt about one another. And then I was this sort of go between. Um, so, you know, you'd, you'd hear like, Oh, you know, I don't, um, what, you know, your father did this to me or your mother, you know, you'd hear and, and you this like, fl and you just flipping kid, you know? And, and I think that's something I, I have had to kind of deal with. I, I'm cool with it now. Like I, I get that it's just, it's just laugh, you know, but, but I do think like if you can improve that, I mean, seriously, you can set your kids up for much, much happier youth because I feel like I'm in some ways five or 10 years behind some of my mates who had a, a happier, stable, more stable youth um, because I've had to like figure that stuff out. Maybe the longer term downstream effect is that I'm actually more resilient because of it. I don't know. Um, but, but it's felt like a negative to me anyway, as a, as a youngster. Um, and I've had to, and, and as a result, there's, there's, there's quite big like rifts in our family still, um, particularly um, in certain areas of our family, which is unfortunate. And, I've learned lots of cool things like both of my folks are, are intelligent people uh, and I'm grateful for that. Mom, mom is like a, she's a flipping, like a, a grammar Nazi of deluxe. And um, <laughs> she, she used to spend lots of time like helping me with like, you know, like correcting my language and, and what have you, which, which is great. I think it's a great skill and to have and reading, you know, she should always like promote reading both my parents would read to me every night, you know, uh, until quite a, like quite an old age, you know, like they would continue reading because that was an important thing. I'd always have books on my bookshelf from a kid, from a young age, you know. Um, and <laughs> there's actually a funny little uh, side story there that, um, so this is their little technique to talk about the birds and the bees, right? To talk, have like some sex education. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so what the trick is, right? For all the parents out there with teenagers or young teenagers, you put the book with the sex education in the bookshelf in the child's room, right? And, <laughs> and so when, you, when you, the parent sees that the book's been changed in the position, then, then you know your kid's interested in that. <laughs> So that's how they're like, ah, you've been uh, looking at the sex book, haven't you? So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so funny, man. <laughs> so that, that was cool, but that's a cool little technique. Um, but yeah, for my folks, I also learned like um, a lot of things about um, tenacity. Like my, my dad was, he had some crazy work stuff going on and he, he actually... Um, 
it's a long story, but he ended up being owed a bunch of money because the company went under blah, 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 blah. And he actually decided to went and studied like tax law and, and, and um, tax, um, I forget what it's called now, CPA, or I can't think what it's called now. Um, uh, and he, I remember him doing that after work. So he'd work all day and then he'd come home and he'd study this freaking massive textbook like this every night for like, I don't know how long, ages. Um, and, uh, and so there was never one for shy of work. And on the weekends we'd be flipping in the garden, you know, I, we, that's one thing I'm grateful for. We were always helping. So like you were never off the hook, you know, like set the table, you know, just do it, you know, um, get in the garden, help us in the garden, um, all these kinds of things. And, and to this day, I like now I've got a little bit of green fingers and stuff like that because I, I think, you know, I think it's important to get your kids outside and helping with things. Um, and, uh, and also they always encourage me to work, um, mm. you know, get, get work at home, <laughs> slave away, <laughs> but also, um, but also then like go and get a job and stuff. So, um, yeah. Uh, and also like they always said, like, as soon as you finish school, if you end up staying at home, you're going to pay rent. Yeah. Like I, it was never a question. It wasn't, I know a lot of other people were like, just got stay as long as you like. But for me, it was like, no ways. As soon as you, you know, done, yeah. you pay rent. So. I yeah. don't know about for you, but we'll ask you next time. But yeah, that, that was for me anyway. Yeah, but I think, I think we're, I mean, it, it's so uh, ridiculous how similar, you know, <laughs> even our parents are. Um, really? But, but I, I actually feel super fortunate that my folks were strict like yours because those gave us some good values in life, don't you think? Oh, 100%, bud. Um, I, I, they also gave, there was an unintended consequence of the strictness though. Um, they were very strict to my parents um, and I wasn't allowed to do a lot of what my other mates were allowed to do. So as a result, I would lie to them a lot because I had to, the only way I could hang out and do things with my mates was to flip and lie. And, um, and that's, uh, you know, I think that's just ridiculous actually, you know, and I wish I didn't go down that path, but if I, if I wanted to do any, so you end up having to be sneaky uh, and you know, like that's, you, I just think that's a bad thing. So just rather be the parents that are like, just be open and honest, you know, let the little bit of the reins loose, but I am still grateful, as you mentioned, you know, to, to, for the strictness it, it did. I was always the responsible one among, along amongst my mates for a lot of the time. So <laughs> I guess it did rub off on me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can only imagine that like, uh, your mom's <laughs> listening to this. My mom probably, you know, our dads and stuff. And they're all just in there rolling their eyes going, I know. wait till you have kids, you guys. Then yeah. you'll find out. <laughs> so, but, yeah. uh, but I guess we're allowed to have our, our side of the story too. So that's, you know, that's important. One day we'll interview them, bud. Yeah, for sure, man. It'll be great. I really look forward to yeah. doing that actually. Um, so, yeah. but talking about family and one of the things and one of the people that's also had a huge influence in your life, as well as I guess I started in the podcast was your grandfather. So mm. tell me a little bit about your relationship with him and you know, who he was and why you sort of cherished him so much. Cool. And yeah, it's a cool question. Um, yeah, I know like certainly you've told me so about your grandfather and I, I can't wait to hear more. Um, and I had a good relationship. I actually lived, we actually lived next door to my grandparents for a long time. Um, which is a great, uh, well, for me as a youngster, it was great. Um, my grandmother, uh, Granny uh, Doreen was her name. Uh, she was just this quintessential um, granny. I don't know, like flipping amazing at like crossword puzzles. Uh, she was like this trivial pursuit genius. <clears throat> And she would make these amazing tapestries with one which is hanging in my house right now um, and cooked like a machine, like just the yummiest stuff. And so they so she was like that, that woman, you know, and just loving, like just this most loving person. And I have real fond memories of her um, and, and just these great conversations we'd have um, and she'd always be caring. And, and, and it's great to think of actually now. So I'm just, you know, just think of having those feelings, um, come back is nice, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and my grandfather was this epic guy, man. He, he was just like this ultimate storyteller. Um, and, uh, he was, he was mischievous and, uh, had the sense of humor as well. Um, like crazy, but in a sort of a dry way. So for example, the one day, <laughs> 
uh, the one day he, um, he used to tease my grandmother. Like he'd, he'd say like all the time, like, where's my tea, Doreen? Oh, I'm not, you know, I can't handle it. Where's, Cause they'd have tea and you know how it goes and back in the day. So anyway, one, <laughs> so one day he's flipping, um, he actually, cause he was a tinkerer, as I mentioned, he was always busy with stuff. So he fell off the ladder and he's probably, I don't know how old he was, maybe flipping, um, 80 or so. He fell off the ladder, right? Um, painting the, the gutters and he crawls in to the kitchen, uh, <laughs> on, on all fours. <laughs> and my, my, my grandmother looks at him and says, Yes, 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 Ken. I'll make your tea now. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, he had actually fallen. But anyway, it was uh, classic. And you know, that was the kind of thing he would do. You know, um, but epic guy. So we, we, he was like, he would take me fishing. Like that was my thing, man. I used to love going with him fishing, and we'd go and stand in his backyard, and he'd teach me how to like. We'd cast with just a sinker on, and we'd just you know cast the sinker in the backyard. Um, he, he was, um, he was in the second world war. He was in North Africa and he used to, he could speak, um, uh, and I've forgotten the, the language um, that he, that he learned, um, but he could speak quite a lot of it. Um, one of the North African languages. Swahili there. or something Swahili, like that. Swahili. That's right. So yeah. yes, Swahili. And, um, so he, um, he actually used to teach people how to drive the, the vehicles and stuff, the army vehicles and all that. So we, all the grandchildren flip and you learn to drive really young wow. um, in the backyard because he was just like, you got to learn. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Then, yeah, so, so we'd go fishing and, and we'd come back and then grand would make like a, um, this amazing, we'd catch whatever we'd caught. We'd, she would make this battered fish for us and we'd sit there together just, you know, like the three of us and, uh, um, and then after the lunch or whatever, we had, he would have a, a moment. We, we have to learn how to waltz. So he taught all of us grandkids how to waltz. So, and uh, he always used to sing. Um, and people listening should listen to the song. Go Google it. It's called Tennessee Waltz. And um, it's a great song, actually. Uh, and I still, like, if I think of my grandfather, he, uh, I think of that song always, you know, because he would always hum, he would hum or sing that song, like, you know, we'd be walking through the, the house or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. And, uh, so yeah, so we, so and he was a real storyteller. So he had he always had these stories of, that that were like amazing. Like he could tell, um, it, it, like we just all the grandchildren would be totally fixated on his when he would tell these stories. And my, like for example, I, I think I mentioned it in the storyboard. Yeah. There's like a little rhyme that he told us. So he had these boxes in the in the in his workshop, and he said, uh, for example. Uh, you see the writing, it was Korean, right? Um, and he's like, do you want to know what that means? And then, um, and I said, we obviously, yes, what's in there? And he'd tell this whole like story around what's in the boxes. And then he would tell this rhyme. And, and, and to this day, my brother and I can still recite the actual, um, the rhyme from, from him. And, and so that's how he had these, like this real creative mind. And um, so I really enjoy. I, I took a lot from, and, and all of us in my family actually, have taken a lot from my grandfather, even though in his youth, apparently he wasn't the nicest guy. He used to drink a lot and stuff, but he stopped drinking and he, and he sort of pulled it together. And, um, and so um, my memories being the youngest, uh, you know, are only fond of my, of my grandparents. So that's cool. Yeah. Those are cool memories, man. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think everyone definitely changes, you know, the older they get, we all seem to sort of mellow out a little bit and, actually start realizing what life is about and um, yeah yeah just become hope well generally nicer people i think um yeah. in our older years so moving on like a, a slight little bit uh, in high school uh, you were quite an active little guy and you, you played a lot of sports uh, you mentioned that you hockey was actually your your main one although i know there were some others and you you played uh, for the province as well, which is amazing. So yeah, just tell us a little about your sporting prowess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not prowess. I, I enjoyed hockey. We had a, we had a good, we had a good team. We, so, so near the end of center five, uh, which is grade seven, uh, our rugby team were, it was in the newspaper for winning the, <laughs> to winning the, the league. And I'm still pretty proud of that even to this day, I'm only 13, but that's funny. But in, in <laughs> high school, I actually, um, I actually lost all that weight. I made a decision that around standard five, I was like, stuff this, I'm going to change something. 
So I um, started to just exercise more and just be more aware of myself, you know. Um, I'm sure that happens. Maybe a puppy fat as well, all that kind of thing. And uh, I started to get into sport more. And uh, yeah, hockey, I ended up um, not a big oak. And uh, I enjoyed rugby actually, but I, I think hockey was just more my, for my frame. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. My brother played and I and, and uh, I just, I guess when you're young, you hit the, the hockey ball in the backyard together when you're small. And then I just got into it like that, you know. And um, yeah, I ended up playing a decent game of hockey. Um, never amazing, but but decent. And uh, I actually, I always said to this day, I was going to play hockey again. And how, when did I finish school? Ages ago. And I still haven't <laughs> gone back. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, I'm like I will one day I will play hockey again <laughs> yeah but you know like I guess they have like veterans hockey and stuff and you know one exactly. day you know you're like oh cool let's get back into it or you know if you have like a little son or something you want totally, to start doing that with, with him one day maybe so 100% yeah yeah and and high school was also quite a formative time for you I think it, it is for most kids but you sort of started discovering yourself a little bit but you're also a little bit of a naughty bugger weren't you yeah a little bit like I think look most people would say this but I think in my defense I was I had some naughty mates <laughs> <laughs> of course you did and, yeah, exactly. and, and, and so like yeah, like we would we would get up to shit a lot of the time, um, and a lot of it was innocent. Um, some of it wasn't so innocent. Uh, and uh, for example, one of my mates <laughs> he used to live on the beachfront, uh, and he this was more I would call this on the innocent side of things. But he'd have like a little pellet gun. It wasn't like a hardcore pellet gun, but it was a it was a decent pellet gun. And so when all these holiday makers would come down to the beachfront, we'd sit in his little window upstairs and we could like shoot people <laughs> walking past. And they would like, they wouldn't know where, <laughs> they wouldn't know where the hell this flipping, you know, where this flipping um, thing is coming from. They would just, and we would hose ourselves, man. And so, yeah, that, that's like horrible now. Like I think, Christ, what, what was I thinking? But anyway, but the one day, one day we were driving along and, so, so this pellet gun was famous. Like it went everywhere with us, and it was like a long-barreled pellet gun. These old ones, mm. and it wasn't super powerful. It wouldn't like break the skin, you know. It was just sting you, just so, just to give that some context. Um, but anyway, so we so the one day I can't remember who it was. One of my mates was like waving this gun at someone in the car, like hijack kind of thing, to scare them, right? <gasps> and the oak. The other oak brings the gun, a real gun out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, this is, they're always like, okay, we're done with the flipping pellet gun. <laughs> Whoa, but yeah, that's, you don't do that in South Africa, flipping out. Oh, yes. So, yes. you know, exactly. So that kind of gave us a shock and we were like, okay, we're done with the flipping, that flipping thing. So, yeah, they were, and then later on in school, look, we, we did the usual thing. We, we were naughty. We started, I started drinking at quite a young age and um, everyone was smoking weed at that stage. So I, I smoked weed a bit with everyone and not like crazy, but uh, you know, it was just around and that was just what we did. We were bored in PE, I guess. And, um, later on, actually we had an exchange student, Fred from Sweden. Um, that was probably when we were around 17 and he, uh, he was really in, when I wrote the storyboard, I actually realized how much of an influence he had on, on me. He, he stayed there with us for six months and he brought this, a mindset that I'd never seen before. Right. So this, you know, I'm going to generalize here, but like Scandinavians generally are like, have enough wealth. They have security. They have all these things. So they actually start to think about politics and, other things earlier than maybe we would in South Africa because there we've got other things occupying our mind more. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so he had all these thoughts on like anarchy, uh, for example, um, socialism, I don't know, all these political ideas. And he, you know, he had Karl Marx and uh, just not that he was into it, just that he had read all the stuff and he had, and he was knowledgeable on it. And I'm thinking, Christ, I haven't read anything like that. I know nothing about what he's talking about. And, um, and it actually stemmed from the music. He, he, I've always been into music and he brought this music that was very like charged with political 
um, rhetoric. And yeah, it was, <laughs> I think it was, re it's really fascinating how music can instill like certain thoughts in your mind and, and, pro and, and promote certain thoughts in your, in the way, you know, and, and the music was, was pretty hardcore music. And, um, but I, I got into it and, uh, and it, it brought this political message along and, and, and so, so he was quite rebellious just naturally. And, um, and it, but it, but it took me out of this sort of small town thinking and realized there's this whole world out there that I had literally had no idea about. So, um, I was actually very grateful for that little bit of that rebellious spark uh, that sort of came from, from outside as it were. Yeah, for sure. And talking about music, uh, you were also playing in a band, is that right? Yeah, exactly. We, we had a band for quite a while. We used to like jam in the garage and we were very much into it. So, um, yeah, as one does at that age, I guess. And, uh, yeah, it was a good fun. We, we played at one or two clubs in PE and we played at like the festivals there and, ah, it was, it was just loads of fun. Though. Like, and we had our little small group of followers in the, in the local area and, uh, we had like one or two fans, uh, that sort of digged us. And yeah, it was just good fun. I think it's just a good experience because what it taught me was if you want equipment, if you want to play, you have to go work for it mm -hmm. and save for something. And then, you know, so you have to plan. And um, so having these little projects, I always think people should be encouraged to have these try stuff, lots of things when you're young and maybe something sticks, maybe it doesn't. Um, but, uh, but it was good fun. And, and we, and we, you know, we, we made a little CD and stuff and what have you. So that was our claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd love to get my hands on that CD, but oh, <laughs> uh, that's classic. Um, yeah, yeah, but curiosity, it's, you know, it's so important, isn't it? To yeah. sort of help grow us and allow us to sort of understand what we do like in life. Um, yeah. just going back a tiny little step, uh, just regarding your, your folks, it just sort of came up now, this question, uh, they, they, they sound like very compassionate people, um, because, you know, they, they took in the exchange students, um, your folks have also adopted, um, a young black girl and, uh, she's, she's effectively your, I guess your half sister. I don't know yeah. um, if you call her half sister. Yeah. Um, yeah. so, so there's a, there's a, to me, it sounds like there's a, there's a deep sense of, of love in them, um, from, from that side of things. For sure, but and this is the weird um, thing that I, you know, um, and, and look, I the, the, I could go down that rabbit hole one hundred percent, and it is a bit of a rabbit hole, um, but they definitely have this massive caring side. So what had basically happened, um, and Siva is a, is a great girl. She's my she's my my sister. She's adopted. So, um, but I I don't I didn't grow up with her, so I don't know her very well because I've been living away, you know, mm. um, but she she's a great girl she's um 11 now um and uh but my folks my mom was made redundant she started to uh uh she wanted to help so give back so she went to a like an orphanage where she could uh you know bath the kids help out basically just volunteer mm. and Anyway, so what, what, what was the long and the short of it basically is that sometimes uh, kids would we, be adopted, they'd come and go, um, and then sometimes one or two kids would be there longer. Um, and what, what the carers do sometimes is that they take the kid home, um, feed them for a day or two, you know, they go back just to give them some love and, and what have you. And, um, and so what happened with Sive is that she didn't get adopted right and her her if i remember correctly her sister had been adopted and um anyway a week turned into two weeks turned into a month and before you knew it my folks were like you know we can't really give her back do mm. you know what i mean we can't, like how can we let this little girl go and live like that again do mm. you know what i mean mm. and um yeah and so that was that was it. They were like, well, we're going to adopt her. And, and that, that was tough on our family though. I'm not going to lie because they're not young. They yeah. don't, they're not super financially set. Um, and uh, it wasn't a real smart decision. It was a loving decision, but smart. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? 
Um, um, but th- those are those kind of tough scenarios that a family goes through. So it's, it's, a, it's a loving act, but it actually created um, a bit of friction, uh, as I mentioned, in our family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. But, but anyway, you've, you've helped someone who's going to have like a, a much more amazing life than they would have. So One would hope uh, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, but tell me, ar- around about 17, uh, your life uh, took a bit of an unexpected trajectory when you witnessed uh, something happen to your family sausage dog. Hey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that was crazy, man. So, anyway, I... Um, you're at, I was 17. So basically you're in, you're at that phase of where, you know, you have to decide what are you going to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> That's just the way it works, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, we'd laughed about this with one of our other guests, but, um, marine biology was always one of the things on the cards, especially <laughs> living at the beach. Um, and, uh, I wasn't really sure. I did love biology. I had always loved animals and what have you. So, um, anyway, Jackie, our little sausage dog was a little overweight and, uh, as they get sometimes and her back started to like get sore and she would, she would, her ears would be hanging and her arch would, uh, sorry, her back would be arched and she would just be visibly in pain. And, uh, it was just horrible to witness. And we took her to the vet, right? Uh, as one does. And the vet says, you know, I don't know what to do here. We can't sort this. There's not much we can do. Why don't you see the chiropractor? And we were both like, what? That's crazy. What are you talking about? (laughs) I didn't even really know what a chiropractor was at this stage. So um, my mother had seen a chiropractor and, 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 you know, loved this guy to bits. He'd helped, he'd helped her a lot. And um, so we phoned the guy up, Robin Dugmore is his name. And he's, and uh, he says, you know, a spine's a spine, nervous system's a nervous system. Bring the dog in, please. Uh, after, you know, after all my patients are gone, I'll, I'll just have a look for you. So we bring the dog in. Long story short, by this stage, Jackie was basically dragging her back legs. They weren't functioning properly because of the, you know, because of the, the pressure on the nerves from the, this back injury. And so anyway, he had her over the knee and he did this and that and did his thing. And basically she walked out where she had basically dragged her legs in. And I saw this in front of my eyes and I was like, good Lord, you know, what just happened? You know, this is incredible. Wow. So that was, I was obviously an, quite impressionable at that stage and it blew me away. And so he gave me a book to read, um, which just blew my mind as well about chiropractic. Uh, and, I, and then I just spent a few, a bit of time with him looking at what he did. And uh, I was just, I just loved it. I was just like, is this really your job? You know, this is great. Um, so I, I said, mom, you know, this is it. I'm moving to Joburg next year um, because my sister lived there to study chiropractic. And, and that was the sort of that beginning of that uh, whole trajectory, actually. Yeah. Wow, man. That's so cool. That is such a cool way to get into what you ultimately end up doing. Hey, and <laughs> yeah. Maybe let's, let's just uh, talk a little bit about uh, Robin a little bit. Yeah. You to mention our Robin Dugmore. Um, it, you, you basically had one of your proudest moments uh, with him. And maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was quite a proud moment. So anyway, Robin was the, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Genuinely, like just Eastern Cape guy as uh, just salt of the earth. Uh, I, I literally, I've never met someone as nice as him. So, uh, and anyway, that was just a pretext to, to the story, but he, um, so he'd got me into chiropractic and not long after that incident, he was actually diagnosed with a brain tumor, which was devastating. And, uh, anyway, I went off to uni in Johannesburg, did my thing there. And I went and I always made a point of when I went back home, I'd try and visit him just to say hi. And I was in sixth year. I was just basically, I think I just finished or just before I'd finished uh, studying, I, uh, um, I went to visit him. And at this stage, he was so ill with a brain tumor that he, he was very weak. And so he actually could only see two people a day, um, mm. which is not is nothing, but he still kept doing it. Like he, even though he was so, he was like, I can only see two. And then he's, then he would be broken. He'd have to go lie down. Right. Mm. But he wanted to still do what he loved. Right. 
And that was super inspiring in and of itself. But anyway, I, I went to see him. Um, he's very weak. He was on the couch. He, and, he, and I said, you know, I just want to tell you, like, I'm finished my studies now. Um, and uh, I just want to, you know, spend some time to say thank you and how much you've mean, meant to me, blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, I always get a little bit emotional just thinking about it. So um, anyway, he's like, great. While you're here, please, won't you just check my spine, you know? And um, so I'm like, oh, my God, this, I was nervous. You know, this is full circle time, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I got to, I got to adjust him and, and uh, you know, he gave me a hug and he's like, this is great. And yeah, that was the, the last time I got to see him. So it's quite sad. Yeah, um, flip, man. That's touching, but yeah. that's really touching. Yeah. And um, yeah, well done for, for keeping in touch with a guy like that, you know, because it says a lot about you as a person, but it says, it just says so much about you, you know, and that's the, that's the Craig I flip it. No, you know what I mean? He, he cares deeply about people and, that's and that's right. testament to, you know, to who you are. Like this, this started at such a young age, you know, so flipping really Thanks. touching story, man. Thanks for sharing Thanks that. Sure. But, yeah, um, cool, man. Maybe we can just now go back to that Joburg part. So it's quite cool. I, I, when I was reading your thing, you, you went to Joburg and you moved into your sister's garage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> basically, you started staying with her, like, you know, then. So just, yeah, let's just talk a little bit about your garage experience. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, my dad and I drive up to Joburg. You know, um, we take the car up. I, he, uh, I got a car, so we drove the car up together which was nice for bonding time uh it's a long drive as you know uh and uh so we get to joburg we go into um town right he drops me we i have to do registration and so for anyone listening where the university is university of Johannesburg is in the center of hillbra which is like one of the most dangerous places in the world literally um it's a crazy crazy place and so the university is in the middle of that. Hmm. So we'd go and do registration. We're walking around. It's like a crazy environment. <laughs> we get back to my sister's house, uh, back in the suburbs, right? And he has to now drive back to PE. And he actually starts crying. He's like, and I, it's like one of the first times I can remember my dad crying. And because he's just like, he can't believe, number one, that I'm moving out. You know, I'm 18, I'm moving out. Um, but also that he's leaving me in a place like this, you know what I mean? So it's quite a, quite a cute like moment, but, um, so yeah, I moved in with my sis and Jonathan, her husband, um, they welcomed me in and I'm eternally grateful for that. And they had like converted their garage a little bit. Um, it was very basic, had like a little bed and a, a tiny little microwave and what have you there. And that's where I stayed for the first year. And, um, yeah, it was awesome because I was studying hard and, and the studying was tough, um, tough going. It was different to school. I kind of cruised school a little bit, um, but uni was a bit, <laughs> was a bit harder. <laughs> and, um, and so um, I'm grateful because my sister and Jonathan, they were always like, okay, it's flipping time for a break. Come, we're going to have, we're going to have a bride. We're going to have some wine. And, we're gonna, and I would be like, no, but I've got to study. <laughs> and they'd be like, no, man, don't be ridiculous. You have to take breaks. And they were always like great with that. And we'd have these, um, I mentioned it earlier, Jonathan and my sister are like, they, they love like the finer things in life. So we'd have these evenings of like tasting these incredible whiskeys or like different blue cheeses or, you know, all these things that I had never grown up with really. I wasn't like our folks didn't weren't into that stuff. And uh, so they exposed me to all these like, amazing foods and they showed me how to cook the things and and i and I, it was like a really special time for me getting to know jonathan as well um and uh and actually he introduced me to a lot of like sort of things that have really molded me into who i am today uh books for example uh and he's a he's a physicist and a and a sort of in the banking industry now but um physicist at, at heart and, and we would have these long conversations about the universe and how it all works. And he actually could answer these questions that I'd had from reading things like a brief history of time. Or, so I'd go and we'd sit there and we'd have these conversations and, he, and he'd explain them to me with stuff I didn't understand. And, and um, with, with, with a real um, deep understanding and a great uh, way of explaining things. And, and it's, it's actually 
changed me as a person getting to know Jono um, because of his knowledge of these things and the books he'd shared with me. Uh, I think Brief History of Time was probably one of them. Um, and uh, so, so that time, it's funny how these things happen. You know, that was a formative time for me, but I'm, but it was because I lived in their the garage. So kind of cool. <laughs> That's really cool, but I can imagine those times of uh, enjoying the, the fine wines and the cheeses definitely trump the two minute noodles that you were cooking for yourself in the <laughs> exactly. microwave <laughs> in your little uh, garage. So that's hundreds. <laughs> you did right. My favorite meal quickly was a two minute noodle. Well, not my favorite. My favorite meal that I could afford was a two minute noodles or two two minute noodles with um, Viennese cut up inside. And then a tin of uh, of those mixed veg. Oh, that would but... be like dinner of champions, but <laughs> yes. what, what flavor of two minute noodles? Cheese, bud. No. <laughs> what about the cu- the curry flavor? Was definitely no, the best. Bro, no, but no trust me. I actually, you, you, when you said two minute noodles, I was like yes. And you said Vienna's, I was like yes. And then you went to spoil to the veggies, but I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah, put the veggies in. Why would you do that? <laughs> yes, and then a bit of English mustard. That would oh, be like yes. loads of that. It's yes. Coleman's. But I remember I used to look forward to Saturday afternoons because I was allowed to have Vienna's on bread. <laughs> it, would be, it would be five bread. Vienna's, four slices of bread, and I'd cut them up like, like properly, you know, and... and yeah. uh, fit them nicely on the each slice of bread and then put uh, all gold tomato sauce and oh. mellow and mild mustard. Oh, mellow yes, and mild. Yes. mild. I used to love that, but it was like, don't, Please that on, buddy. don't worry. I don't need chocolate or anything. That Those four, five Viennas and four slices yes. of bread was amazing. But <laughs> I could eat that right now. Yeah? Like, mm. I, actually, it, I don't know how good it is for you, but it's flippant. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Like but but Yes, I know. Baloney. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's so funny, man. It's Basically. so cool, Remin. <laughs> it is. Uh... So, but you had actually already been suffering with inflammation uh, from your teenage years, but you yeah. then got diagnosed with an- ankylosing spondylitis. Excuse my pronunciation. Well done, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about that because that was tough. Yeah, man, it's been a big part of my life, unfortunately. Um, it's, uh, it started school, I had a, um, this crazy inflammation in my eye. And, um, and I didn't know, you know, you don't know what it is. And it was sore. And my, my, the way I found out was my pupil stopped working. It just what? didn't dilate when I looked. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell is this? And it was like a party trick for a few. And then I realized, okay, that's actually bad. Could um, you see? And so I could like- see, but it was blurry, but I, but I could see. But I kind of just, you know how it is. You go like, oh, whatever, just get on with it. It'll be a fine. And anyway, it didn't go away. And long story short, they had to inject cortisone into my eyeball, which is freaking insane. But let me tell you, mm. you have to sit there still. And then they, with, you know, you're wide awake. And then they go underneath, mm. like, your eyeball with a, with a needle, which was one of the most horrific things I've had to do. <laughs> but anyway, oh. so that's, and then the guy said, look, the, the ophthalm, ophthalmologist said, listen, if you're getting this, you've probably got a gene that, and, uh, that is, can, can lead to certain kinds of autoimmune diseases, right? Anyway, I brushed it away. I was like, whatever, man, get on with it. And, um, and eventually that went away. So fast forward, um, I ended up getting severe, like near the end of studies, I, I got severe inflammation. I could hardly walk, um, my knee and my hip was swollen. It was, it was really bad. I, I tried all sorts of treatment. Nothing was working. Uh, I went to ultimately ended up at a rheumatologist because, and you had to suck like fluids out from my knee and stuff because it was so swollen. Hmm. And anyway, they put me on this really strong medicine because nothing else was working. And this medicine actually helped inject. I had to inject myself with it. Um, and so, yeah, that was, um, it was horrible, like, because I was embarrassed. Number one, I'm like in this health industry, um, and I'm 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 fucked basically. Like, I couldn't, like, I could, I, everything was sore, and like, I couldn't get out of bed on my own. It was like really bad. Um, and I tried to man up and get on with things, and but luckily the medicine worked, and I, I started feeling great. Um, fast forward again, 
I come off the meds, I'm feeling good. I'm like, sweet, I'm healed. There was just some random crazy thing that happened to me. Fast forward to the Netherlands, which we'll probably come to. I, I end up getting it again, just as bad. Um, but at this stage now, the pressure's on because I'm, I'm earning money for the two of us, myself and my partner, Chantal at the time. Uh, uh, and yeah, so I had to work. Like there was no two ways about it. So I'm like, every day is like, basically I'm almost in tears, like going to work and it's like, but I got to go. So I just did it. Um, and it was a really tough time. And um, I ended up going back onto this medicine. And you got to understand some of the, the subtext here is that as a chiropractor, you kind of don't want to be on medicine because mm. it's like you're trying to be anti-medicine in a way. You know mm. what I mean? And here I am, like nothing else is helping me. So I realized like something has to change. Like something is causing this. Yes, there's a gene, but I'm not like a slave to the G my gene. So, and I'm, I'm reading and I'm, under I'm like really going in depth with like how to do, like understand what's causing my own body to hate me. That's the way I felt, you know? And, um, and so that's when it kind of took me on a journey of, of trying to understand that. And, uh, uh, but yeah, but it's been a big part of my life and uh, it's something that I don't talk about a lot because it's kind of, number one, people don't really care. I always feel that's my honest, like how I really feel like deep down, like, and, and no one really knows how it feels, <laughs> you know, so like, it's, what's the point of trying to explain it? And number three, um, I don't, like, I don't like to complain. So like, you know, get on with it and, and I'd prefer people to not focus on me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. so, so like, I just kind of left, I, I try not to talk about it much, but anyway, that, that is a, it is a part of me and it, it actually has shaped the way I see health and things that much more because I've been through it right now. It's been three years. I haven't had any medication. I've changed a lot of things in my life and yeah, I think I'm, I'm super stoked about all that. So yeah, good. Yeah. Happy ending for now anyway. Yeah, but it's hectic because I didn't realize that it had actually come back. And this was when we actually had knew each other, I think. Um, yeah. You know, at least we had, we had first met and you'd yeah, started suffering from it again. I mean, obviously, you we weren't in the same vicinity as each other and we'd only yeah. see each other on certain occasions. But um, yeah, kind of like I wish I knew more at the time. I would have like, I guess, in some way try to help because I think I know what you mean about people not caring um, because everyone has their own stuff yes. to deal with. Uh, but then I'm still sure, I, I still know there are some people deep down that will be like, flipping out, let me help you out in some sort of For way. Sure, you know, there, there, sure, there are right. going to be that five or so people that genuinely do want to have your That's back. True, you know man. what I mean? That's true. That's one of the things I've learned through that, through that process. You did right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but a cool thing also happened when you were in Joburg, uh, when you, I think we were working, uh, you met your now wife Shanti and, uh, yeah. she worked downstairs from where you were. So can you just tell <laughs> us about that sort of meet and how that sort of took off? <laughs> yeah, that was cool, man. So I was working upstairs at this wellness center and, uh, and, they, and uh, the one day I was just working, walking into work and I could look down at the coffee shop at the bottom. And there was this bird there that I was like, yes, who's this, you know? <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I proceeded to go and introduce myself. That was the, that was this, the inverted commas there. Um, you know, I'm the new Cairo, but I'm actually just wanted to go meet her, you know? <laughs> so um, uh, anyway, so we went and chatted and she was telling me about how she'd had these headaches for such a long time. So I'm like, come up to the room. I'll have a look for you. You know, I've got no patience. It's just started, you know, <laughs> like, come on up. And, um, so anyway, we, we just sat and we just chatted for like, uh, for like an hour, you know, about all these things that I hadn't really ever chatted with people about before, you know, like kind of all, all sorts of things, the universe and, and how we all fit into it and all these crazy things. And um, yeah, it was just really, really amazing. And uh, we just kind of hit it off uh, straight away. And, uh, and, and not long after that, uh, we just started dating and it was, and we've, 
we've had like a little break in between once, but uh, other than that, we have never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so weird because on the storyboard you wrote, you said when she came upstairs, you went into the room and you like took off your shirts <laughs> and you're like, uh, okay, so what do you, <laughs> uh, why yeah, did you tell me a different story? <laughs> that's the, like a special story for you uh, and I, buddy. Uh, <laughs> obviously, I'm joking, I'm joking. But okay. no, that's cool, man. That's cool. It's like such a great way to meet somebody. Yeah. So, but good time. yeah, for sure. You, you mentioned Netherlands, obviously you spent a good amount of years there, uh, but it was also kind of serendipitous how you made it to the Netherlands because it wasn't actually plan A, was it? No, it wasn't actually. It's funny because just after I'd qualified, I went and wrote my exams in, um, in Australia, here in Australia. Well, actually I wrote them in New Zealand um, and they have this agreement um, across the, the trans Tasman Tasman agreement, <laughs> um, and uh, so you write the exam in the one, and you get qualified there. It, it works in both, um, and they were just cheaper, so that's why I did them there. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, so I wrote my exams with the intent of maybe coming to live here one day with my bro, um, and uh, yeah, by the beaches and just have a change, you know. Um, Cause I'd reached a point where I could either sort of stay where I was and sort of buy the practice and continue working in Joburg or, or have a change. You know, that's ultimately what ended up getting to. And anyway, the, the visa just took forever for Australia as it can. And ultimately like we just couldn't get hold of them. It, nothing was happening. They didn't know what was happening. So I thought, you know what, let me just put my feelers out to Europe because I had one or two mates that had been over, gone over. And anyway, the same day, these people come back and they say, we want to, can you, when can you start kind of thing? And I was like, oh shit, I didn't expect that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So um, now I had to decide, okay, do I, uh, do I, I haven't heard from Australia. Do I make this, do I say yes or no to this Dutch company? And um, I said, you know what, stuff it, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. So I, so I said, yes, I will start. When can we sign? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, this was the weird part. Um, literally like two days after I had agreed um, to go to the Netherlands, uh, I got the papers for Australia. So I was like, oh my God, now what do I do? Do I go against what I agree, my verbal agreement um, and just go to Oz? But at this stage, I was almost like a little bit embittered by it all. So I was like, you know what? Stuff you... Uh, bastards I'm gonna go to the <laughs> Netherlands. That's, that's kind of how I felt so I'm like sweet I'm gonna go to the Netherlands um, and had a great five years there uh, and uh, I didn't look back however the Australia was in the back of my mind um, that time mainly just because I wanted to be closer to family and also the weather and um, so when I got the opportunity again I, I took it to come to to Australia yeah that's cool, man. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so you, so you basically you arrive in Netherlands. You don't necessarily know many people. You don't speak the language. It's a new culture. How was that transition for you? Oh, it was tough uh, at times, to be honest. I, I rock up there, right? Um, at this stage, I was in a small town down in the um, southeast of the Netherlands, and basically at that stage, the shops weren't open on a Sunday, right? So I arrived there in the middle of winter. It's February. It's flipping cold, right? I, I've never, I didn't know cold existed like that. So, you know, I thought I had a, I had a little jersey that I, you know, like that's what I thought would be fine. So um, I rock up there. I wake up. I'm my first day in the Netherlands. I walk outside. I'm excited to explore the city. And I flipping, I didn't see one person. It was dead. Oh. And I was like, what the fuck have I done here? Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I was shocked and I, I just looked around and I was like, there's no one here. So I didn't realize, but every, every Sunday at that stage, all the shops are closed and everyone sleeps late and nothing happens until like 11, 12 o'clock, you know? Um, but I had a bit of a shock moment. There. It was a bit of a shock in my life. I was like, what have I done? You know? Um, but anyway, and it turned out it was a big adventure because, um, walking into a very busy, busy practice. Uh, the, the work volume was like physically, mentally demanding because I'm trying to learn Dutch. 
um, which is tiring in and of itself when you when you're forced to be under pressure to talk Dutch because people some a lot of people couldn't speak any English like they're like old people and stuff um, and and then under this high work volume uh, which is can be quite physical in my job and uh, I was just knackered for the first six months man and the funny thing is the guy that I took over from there we became friends and he said um, I bet you we, you taking me to this fancy restaurant, right? You take, if, if you haven't lost 10 kilograms in the first six months, so weigh yourself today and I'll wait. We'll talk again in six months. And I had, I had lost 10 Ks. No way. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I had to get him lunch. <laughs> no way. Is he so, serious? Yeah, yeah. Just from like the work, the volume and like the, and just the stress of, of, of like, I don't know, just, it was just intense, you know? Um, but yeah, we still laugh about that. So that was, that was quite funny, but it was a great experience. I learned a lot. I learned about how to run a flipping good business. Like they ran a, a tight ship. Um, I learned about another culture and I got to hang out in Europe and go travel. So it was a really great experience. And if I hadn't gone there, we probably wouldn't have this podcast, you know? So yeah. I got to meet, um, my brother from another mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but for sure, man. We'll get there in a second. But just, just, just talking about the work a little bit, but it was, like you said, it was intense though. And you worked six days a week. Yeah, yeah. So I was working a half day on the Saturday, but the, but the rest, and I, it was just long days. It was just, I was like a mechanic, like a, I was a machine. Like you just, you just adjusting one patient to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And, uh, and you just do that all day, every day. And, uh, it was a bit soul destroying at times because I, it wasn't, it lost a bit of the personal interaction and, uh, it was good money, you know, like I, I was happy with that, but, but, but that was probably the, and, and also my colleagues there, I, I've made lifelong friends with the people there, like my, the people that were my receptionists and stuff at the time. Um, I still keep in contact with them. Um, and, uh, so, so, but, but the actual, um, work itself i couldn't work like that again uh it was but but also it's a good experience you, you know what you don't like by, by going through those experiences so um uh, it taught me a lot yeah i can imagine but i can imagine yeah. um so but maybe we can just talk a little bit about uh you and shanti uh, as well in the netherlands so firstly how did you convince her to come over with you ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so first of all, she was, she couldn't get a visa, right? No, 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 that's not true. It just took time to get a visa for her because I had to first finalize mine and then I had to get a partner visa. So it was at least six months. So there was six months where she, where I was in the Netherlands and she was still in South Africa. The convincing part, I, it, it, it was a bit, uh, it wasn't easy because Shanti had a, a business that was very successful going there uh she uh she had basically she had a job and a business so she was pretty busy and, and pretty in the thick of it um her sister was there uh her twin sister so that you know and so it, it, it took a bit of convincing but at the same time it also didn't we were both like we want to have an adventure like i, I guess before i went we obviously discussed this stuff you know what i mean like mm. okay, i'm gonna go would you want to come? I won't go if you don't want to come, you know, kind of thing. So I guess there was a bit of that leading up. And by the time I got there, um, it, uh, yeah, she was keen, just she wrapped everything up and was ready to come over. Um, it was quite funny though, because I had obviously been to the shops there and I'd, I'd had these little like, like Dutch clothes, I suppose. I don't, I don't know how else to put it really. And so when she arrived, she's like, she was shocked. she was shocked because she was like, "Who is this person?" Like, <laughs> and like had a different style, and, I was, and we still laugh about that today. I was probably trying to be cool, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, that's so classic, but uh, that's classic, man. So, so also maybe just talk a little bit about your relationship um, as a couple there, because it wasn't it wasn't easy, mm. um, and it took a little bit of strain, I think, uh, just from you know, the chats yeah. and stuff we probably had. Yeah, but it was tough because um, I was just working all the time 
And here Chantal is in another country, in a small town, right? Um, not speaking Dutch. And it's flippin' cold and it's different. And you've got to understand, like, when you go to a country that you can't speak any of the language initially, it's the small things are difficult. So you go to the flippin' shop and you don't even know how to, like, how do you ask for this and that? And look, there's still people that speak English. Don't be wrong. It's not entirely... But, but it's still harder. So all these small things combine and to make it quite a tough experience when, when you're doing it on your own, when I've already had six months there, like fig, figuring it all out. You know, A lot of stuff had been laid out for me because I was working for this company. When Chantel arrived, it, it was just like, okay, cool, you go get on with it. <laughs> you know. Mm. Um, so it was tough for her um, because, uh, because she didn't, you, you, it's not easy to make mates. Where do you go? Who do you meet with? Um, and so there were tough times and it, we really used to live basically for the, for sun, for Saturday afternoon after work. So live for the weekend, uh, and live for our holidays where we would go with, to meet you or other friends or, um, and that's also not a life really, you know, yeah. uh, you can't live for these punctuation points along your life journey. You have to kind of enjoy a day to day, which was hard because I'd just come home and I'd be absolutely buggered mm. and we'd eat and go to, go to bed like that. That was it, you know? And, uh, so we, we did, we took strain in terms of, um, uh, you know, just in terms of, I guess the relationship, not too much, but mainly just, we were both just like, didn't like that situation. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like and, just stuck in limbo. Yes, that's right. And ultimately, um, with time, you know, time heals everything. Shanti's language improved. She got it work. Uh, and then we started to meet cool people and expats and stuff. And then we have this really awesome group of friends um, uh, that who we still stay in, stay in touch with now. Um, and, and living, and that's the cool thing, when you live in a country like that, where the language is different, you end up having an expat life because you're speaking to the people that speak your language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you often hang out with it. And all these people are also interesting people because they've come from diverse backgrounds and are living in a country as an expat. Um, and so I enjoyed that aspect of living there. Um, and that ended up making it all more comfortable for the two of us. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Connection and, and friendship, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, and, and also it's so nice to see now like you guys and how you're both flourishing in australia and um yeah we'll, we'll get there in a second but i'd just like to talk a little bit about what is a chiropractor and like what is your speciality because i'm always mesmerized when you talk to me about it you know you you totally take for granted the the knowledge and the wisdom and the expertise that you have and I just think it's, it's super inspiring listening to you talk about uh, what you do, but also health is an overall thing. Thanks, my man. Um, that's kind of you. Um, yeah, most people, when they think of a chiropractor, they've heard something from their auntie or their mate or their brother about back cracking, uh, bone crunching, something to this effect. You know, a lot of people have this idea. And that's fine. You, you know, you, you do get, you get some cowboys out there like you do in any industry, you know, you have good and bad dentists, you have good and bad doctors, you have good and bad painters, you have flipping good and bad chiropractors. So that's the first thing to just remember, right? When you, when, when you're understanding what a chiropractor is, um, just because there's a lot of talk about it. Um, but what it actually is, is a philosophy. Um, a lot of it. Uh, so around health, and the whole premise of what it's based on is that our, our body is a self-regulating and a self-healing system. And this, the, that system, the symphony of all your organs working together is governed by the brain, right? And the brain is this puppet master, the, the master computer that is keeping everything in check and in balance and how does the signal from the brain get to the body it travels through this tube of bone called the spinal cord basically to your organs glands and muscles and then back up again if there's a 
breaking that communication system, something is not functioning as well as it could be or as it should be. And so you're not expressing your health to its fullest potential. And so that is really what we do. So we're looking for that interference in, the, in that tube of bone. So you've got to imagine the spine is a movable suit of armor protecting the spinal cord because there's only two organs in the human body covered in bone. And it's the brain and the spinal cord. They're very important organs. So, but because it's movable, that, that vertebra ends up creating uh, impingements or irritations or something to that effect on the spinal cord, on the nerves. And that limits the, the, the potential of the function of that system. And so we try and achieve a correction, a gentle specific correction to try and make sure that those signals are flowing to and from the brain as best as possible. And that's sort of what we do in a nutshell. See what I said, people. Mesmerized. <laughs> <laughs> so, so but it's, it's totally fascinating and I, I love what you do. And it's so interesting. Like after I first met you guys and cause I rocked up and everyone there was basically a chiropractor <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I was like, cheapers, I, I want to study to be a chiropractor. <laughs> I was like, can I do it? Is it too late? <laughs> so, um, but also, I know you have obviously a patient, a doctor, confidentiality, but are there any, or just maybe choose one, like story of like how you've helped somebody uh, with, yeah, yeah, yeah. With, 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 uh, how I've helped them. Oh, cool, man. Um, so there's, there's a few ways to look at this. The first way to look at it is come and spend a day with me and, and a lot of this, well, any chiropractor, uh, you will see interesting stuff every day, which I take for granted often. So there's a lot of cool stuff that I just go, oh, that's kind of normal, right? So, which I'm very grateful for. There are a few stories that everyone has, I guess, in the industry that, that stand out, right? And this one girl, um, she came to me in the Netherlands. She stands out and uh, she's very special in my heart because she changed the fundam She changed a certain knowing within myself about what I do. Uh, and, and that is very powerful. Do you know what I mean? You, you'd read the textbook, you'd read the, you'd understand what you do in theory works until it actually works. Do you know what I mean? And that, that kind of the penny drops. And so anyway, with this little girl, she comes in to see me, her mom brings her in. She's, um, she was young. She was, I think she was around two when I saw her, right? I, in my ignorance said, I don't know if I can help. So she'd come in with this incredibly bad, um, constipation right since basically she was born hmm. so this poor little girl had enemas every day of her life she had um adult dose laxatives every day wow. she would cry herself to sleep every day and her life was just a mess the cutest little girl and she was uh yeah, she, she just she was just unhappy. Obviously, I imagine that's your life. Anyway, I said, look, I don't think I can help. This is not this is not chiropractic. You know what I mean? What the hell? This is some kind of medical issue. That's the way I was thinking. Anyway, fast forward to the end of my time in Netherlands. Five years later, she comes back. She's a seven year old girl, uh, and she comes back. Nothing's changed. She's she's gone everywhere. She's gone to every specialist. She's been to I can't even tell you how many people she'd seen enemas every day, crying herself to sleep. Uh, she can't, she's a gymnast, but she sucks it. Well, she's not sucks, but she, she, it hurts her every day to gymnastics because her tummy is so sore mm. and her life is flipping miserable. Anyway, I said to her, you know what? I don't know if I can help, but I, you can come and lie here and I'll, you know, you've seen everyone else. What's the, what's the harm in trying what I do? Do you know what I mean? So I changed my mindset a little bit. Anyway, two or three adjustments later, right? Her tummy started to go. And, and like a week after that, 
that, that she goes to the doctor and the doctor's like, well, come off of the medicine. So she came off her medicine a week after that. A week after that, she stopped having enemas. And so like a month later, she's, she's a normal little girl. She's flipping, going to the toilet. She doesn't have to have enemas. She doesn't cry herself to sleep. And now she's a, um, a state uh, a gymnast in, the, in the Holland. And uh, so it's just like, I can't even tell you like how special that is to me, like, and to her and her family and her mother's like her mother. I've never seen someone so like grateful for something because she doesn't have to give her child enemas every day. And she doesn't have to listen to her child crying in bed every night. And so you can imagine how that influenced me. Like that was a, a massive influence and, and there was no other reason for it. Nothing else had changed. She tried everything. She just had a few adjustments on her sacrum, which is the, the nerves that go to like the, the, the pel, uh, to the um, uh, digestive system. I just gently worked on that a little bit and yeah, it worked. And I was like, even I was shocked. I was like, shit, I, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a beautiful story, but, I, but it, it's, um, it's still very close to my heart. And they've sent me some pictures of her and all this stuff, you know, later down the track now, which is cool. Wow, that's incredible, man. Flipping out. Yeah. Life-changing stuff, but well done. That's yeah, just, thanks. That's, that's such a cool story. No, it's, it's a great story, man. I, I'm very, very close to my heart. Thanks. Yeah, yes. I mean, the girl is probably forever indebted to you, you know, for, yeah. for you doing that. So, yeah, that's yeah. specific. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so, bad. we have to, just for one second, talk about uh, a weekend in... The party capital <laughs> of the world <laughs> where this relationship first started and yeah we both met i think it's 2013 but uh, in ibiza on a weekend um so yeah maybe just tell your little side of that story yeah i think you know we've we've told the story of once or twice so I'll, I'll be brief with it but it's it was a great story man like i one of my best holidays I've ever had. That's like hands down, maybe the best, you know. Um, rock up uh, in Ibiza, first time there, flipping super excited. This is from my side, obviously, um, uh, with some mates. And then we meet this other girl, Sarah, uh, through friends of friends. And she's awesome. And she's like, oh, my one mate's coming to stay here, if you don't mind, or, or wants to come out with us. He doesn't know. He has a place to stay, blah, blah, blah. And we were like, cool, man, whatever. Um, no big deal, really. We didn't really think too much about it. And uh, anyway, in walks that evening. So we're all getting ready. We're showering. You know how it, you know how it goes. You're ready to go out. Uh, everyone's putting on their fancy clothes and ready to party. Uh, and <laughs> this guy rocks up, knocks on the door, and <laughs> he's got this... He's got a flipping vest on, like a singlet. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he's got these flipping guns, my man. Yes, they were like bursting out. And, I, we, and, and everyone was like, yes, is this like a bit of a dick? Or what, what's the story here? But, you know, like, you know, when you like, totally, but some oak comes in, you know. And yeah. anyway, but straight away, you had this massive smile and you were just like high five and you gave everyone hugs and what have you. And, and anyway, it was pretty apparent very early on that that you were a cool oak and we're gonna have the best time so we rock up at the club all of us we flip and partied like crazy this gareth has his shirt off he's flipping, <laughs> going through the crowd <laughs> partying like i've never seen before i didn't even see him half the night i don't know i just said glimpses of uh, of the shirt this guy just partying like crazy it was we had a great night um and Anyway, that morning we get back to the hotel and uh, maybe he can tell the story next time. You guys will have to listen to the where he ended up next time. But, but it was an epic, epic time. And we also had some serious time where we got to chat. And we, and we it's like in the morning, we were having these conversations. I've still got a photo. I should probably post that photo. Yes. We looked so rough, like ridiculously rough. But both of us we took photos of each other and we just met, right? You got to understand. And, and we still, we laughing like so much because we look so rough on the photos. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but we still had the, we, I knew like this Oak's a nice guy because we, we were like cool with laughing at each other and ourselves. And, uh, and that was, I guess you kind of get this glimpse into 
like your new buddy, you know what I mean? And, and that was a really special time. And, and obviously from there, we've just uh, got to hang, hang out a lot more and uh, have a lot more times like that, which is, which is great, man. I'm very, very, very grateful for that weekend. Yeah, but same here, man. And yeah, it was, it was just such a great, a great meeting. And um, yeah, I just laugh about the whole, the whole weekend, but we just, uh, just connected straight away and have so many funny stories. And it's just, it was a special, a special moment. And you know, these things are meant to happen for sure. But yeah. um, the world was, I was not meant to have accommodation booked that night. <laughs> that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's and, what it comes uh, down to. Hey, isn't yeah. that weird? Yeah, it is, but it is. Um, I look forward to hearing your like take on that next next. Yeah, week. for sure, but for sure. <laughs> and so, so also, I guess, like you know, we obviously we've we've met a lot of times since then. You know, since that first time in Ibiza, and we went on lots of trips and stuff, and that was super cool. Um, and we really formed a, a strong relationship, and but then it came the time to move to Australia for you quite a few years mm-hmm. later. And you've now been there for, you know, for a couple of years, probably a bit longer than that. Um, how difficult or easy was that decision to go to Australia? It was tough, my man. Um, a lot of people had said, what are you thinking to us? Uh, like, you're not too far away from getting Dutch citizenship. Um, we were earning decent cash. We had a nice home that we had bought. Uh, and everything was going sort of swimmingly along. However, under the surface, I still had this idea of maybe at some stage, not knowing when really, but maybe going to be near my brother because if I'm there and he's there, maybe my sister will come there. Then we're all together again. That this was kind of my, um, my vision, you know, I'd, I'd kind of had my aunt and uncle were here as well. Uh, my cousins. Uh, so, you know, suddenly you start saying, Hey, there's we, something can happen here, you know? Um, and, uh, so I, the guy that I'd originally wanted to get the job with here actually contacted me one day pretty randomly and just said, you know, there's this job available if you want to come and, but you have to come quick. So we had like, literally like, it, there was no time to decide, like, do you want to come or not? You know? And yes, it was a tough decision. We were like, oh shit, what do we do? And we just said, you know what? Do we want to live in this cold environment for the rest of our lives? Can we picture that? If yes, great, we just stay. If we were like, no, actually it's not us entirely, then we should go. And we were like, it's not us entirely. <laughs> so we said, okay, cool. That, from that point on, it was easy. Wrapped everything up, sold everything, well, kept the house, sold everything else, whatever, got um, tenants. But what the cool thing was, <laughs> what made it a lot easier was I had been chatting to a friend of mine in South Africa who was a chiropractor and he'd had some, he was a bit uncertain about things in South Africa, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to devise this plan. So I'm like, do you want to come and work in my role where I am here? He's like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm like, cool, no worries. I'm going to organize this. So then I'm like, get, like speak to the lady, the, the, the owners of the business. I said, this, I know this guy, he's top notch. You don't have to interview, I'll organize it. Cool. So my mate, John, he, uh, he's like, yo, we actually want to come, no worries. And then I was like, I also have this home, you know, that I need to rent out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you by any chance need a place to rent? And he's like, cool. So he basically replaced me in my home and in my job. And uh, he, he's moved out last weekend actually <laughs> wow but <laughs> he's been there for he's been in there for almost three years and um it made my life a lot easier i'm also in, indebted to him because him and his wife who have now had a baby in that home which is very special um have looked after it like their own mm. and uh, so that's that's invaluable as you know when you've got a rental yeah uh, so uh so that was quite a funny little story that that happened um so that helped making the decision easier um it was tough because I didn't want, I have some good friends in, in Holland um, and I didn't want to leave them. Uh, but you, you, you kind of just have to make the decision and getting further away from you. Um, it was tough because we'd go skiing, blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't sure when we'd hook up again, you know? Um, so from that perspective, it was tough. But for all other, to all other intents and purposes, 
once the decision was made, it was made and we, we kind of just went. So the transition here was okay. Got here and uh, yeah, we haven't looked back. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've obviously spoken about it a lot and you know, you've said it's probably one of the best decisions you've ever made in your life. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Chantelle has literally thrived here. Like she, she's just, I, I hit the straps, you know what I mean? Like just going super well, business is thriving, made some good mates. Um, I've made some good mates. But the, the interesting thing was, this is an interesting thing as a bit of an aside. We had to downsize. So we were earning, we got here, we had, uh, we had saved a bit, but not ridiculous amounts. We'd saved a bit of cash. Um, we had, but I was earning a lot less here, right? So I'm used to having this nice salary. So suddenly I don't have this nice salary anymore. So that's a bit weird, like a little bit stressful as well. Chantel's not working because we just moved here. Um, and so we get into a small apartment, flipping not much stuff. And we were like, this is the happiest we've ever been. <laughs> so we were like, it was an amazing lesson in life. Like you, you, it's not about things. Like I know it's so cliche, but it just isn't. And we've like, now it's like we can live anywhere. And if you've got the people around you that you care for and a roof over your head and enough money to eat, you flip and happy, you know, like mm. you don't need much more than that. And so anyway, um, that was a great lesson on coming here. And I think that changed my relationship to money a lot. And in doing so, made coming here one of the most important things or, or experiences of my life. Um, and now I, I don't come at things from a money angle at all. Um, it's more of what else can I, that's why we do the podcast, for example, you mm. know, um, and we, we, we haven't, we have, I know you very much like that, Gareth. I mean, you've, you were one of the people that have always been a good influence in that specific realm as well on me about, you know, you'd always you always give sound advice to me about that and, and thoughts on that. And it's helped shape my th ideas around it. And I'm yeah super grateful for that, man. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with the move. Yeah, but that's awesome. And, and it's also, you know, from, from my perspective, it's been amazing to see the change in you, like as a person, uh, the, pro the progress you've made is just like awesome to see, you know, just taking all these incremental steps to getting to the life that you really want to live in terms of, you know, working less, um, in the clinic, um, and mm -hmm. then building something else and you're building something that's really, really cool. It's amazing to see like you and Shanti flourish as a couple together and starting to work on something together too. And then also, you know, probably one of the nicest things is to see Shanti, like, like just like you said, she's just, rocking it right now mm. you know and it's yeah. the change in her as a person is just is just amazing so um Thanks, man. well done for for making that decision bud and and it's it's just been beautiful to really see how how you two guys have um just changed and, and grown so much you know um, Thanks, buddy, yeah. individually Thanks and together me. yeah individually yeah. and together so, so that's really really awesome it's very inspiring as well bud Thanks, um, but I appreciate that. Yeah, for sure, man. Maybe you can just, before we finish off, tell us a little bit about where you feel things are going for yourself um, as, a, as a person, individually, as a couple, as, um, yeah, just what are you excited about uh, moving forward? A lot of excitement. <clears throat> um, I feel like as my journey goes on in life, I feel like life is short and it's long and it's a kind of a feeling that I've been thinking about a lot and uh, it's short and I want to live my life as if it's short more uh, and enjoy being present more uh, and be more in the now. So, so looking to the future, my future looks like me trying to be more present, if you know what I mean. <laughs> That's like part of part of that it's just such a liberating feeling knowing that the only place i need to be right now is speaking to you do you know what i mean and to everyone out there um that's that's a real important base for where where i want to move forward right um the 
actual future is exciting because it's long as well, like I was saying. And things take time to manifest and to grow and to expand. And I'm okay with that nowadays, <laughs> which is cool. So my future and our future with Chantal and I and with you and I and with my family and everyone else, um, it looks like me trying to iron out my own, become a better human being as best as I can. I want to iron out all the things that I feel are my f flaws. And I want to really, I really want to um, be congruent in my life moving forward more and more. That's like, you know, that's a really important thing for me. I am open to the idea of living anywhere now. Um, and you've got this super exciting adventure where you are going, you and Marissa, and, I, and obviously we'll talk about that more. I don't want to steal your thunder there, but that's in the back of my mind, like Portugal, other areas. You know, I, at this stage, I used to think, you know, you have to be in an area. This is it. You, this is where you have to just be. And I'm okay with that not being necessarily the truth, you know. And that's been a big shift for me because that I never thought like that before. So I'm quite open to changes. First, coming back to the more tangible things, I'm excited for the people you and I are going to speak to in the future. I'm excited for exploring our relationship with you, the listener, and with you, Gareth. And I'm excited for... Uh, seeing where this adventure of ours is going that's like a as you know like it's a, it's a massive chunk of our lives and it's it's given me a lot of meaning in my life uh, and purpose and that's flipping invaluable to be honest like i don't know it's just you can't put a price on how important that is and what and how much it's given me so moving forward i i look forward to seeing just expanding what we're doing now uh, in terms of the impact that we can have in people's lives. Um, and I look forward to working on, on the, uh, as a chiropractor for the rest of my life on, in some capacity that will always continue. Um, and I will, and we're also building a, a business on the side called simply seal uh, with Chantel. And that's, and that's building up as well. We're trying to get that going. And so there's exciting things, but I'm okay with change nowadays, way more than I ever was. So, um, I'm happy to like see how this adventure turns out. And that's what makes me excited about the future. Mm, that's amazing, man. Convoluted yeah, answer there, but yeah. No, not convoluted at all, <laughs> but very articulate and clear. Um, so thanks, man. It's nice to, I guess, like you said, the one word purpose, but just finding yeah. that purpose is, is huge. Um, so yeah, uh, my man, as you know, we have a, favorite last question <laughs> uh, I hope you've practiced <laughs> uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you <laughs> all right without trying to be as convoluted as the previous answer it is a complex question and it is something that you and i have got to ponder a lot you know and we've had amazing people on this podcast uh, and amazing answers to that question. And I'm so grateful you thought of asking everyone that. That was a, such a good idea. Um, and because it's such a, it's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's two layers to this question in my mind. The first one is that uh, there's certain things we all kind of assume are ridiculously human. We want to be loved uh, we, we want to have friendships. We want to have connection with other humans, with, uh, with nature, you know, find our tribe and we want to be heard and appreciated. I think those are like fundamentals. That's ridiculously human. Then there's this, like another layer that I think stuff that, that I think probably you and I both feel similarly on these, these deeper topics. And one of the big one that comes up a lot is vulnerability. So being around, being vulnerable around others is at the core of this basically. So um, when you are vulnerable, it gives others the chance to be vulnerable and then your real humanness is able to be explored. So that's a real human trait, you know, um, because at the end of the day, we most of us are just putting up 
facades and masks, but that can be explored when you, when someone shows some vulnerability um, and then you see, okay, there's the real person there, you know? Um, and yeah, we, we, part of the vulnerability is, is being okay with being wrong sometimes. Um, and being able to say, I don't know. And it's, and it's a really liberating thing. And, uh, to be able to do that. I don't think it's naturally a very human trait, but I think it's, if you want to be ridiculously human, you've got to be okay with saying, I don't know. Um, and then I also think uh, sort of, um, I think compassion comes off the back of, of uh, being vulnerable yourself. So um, there's always three sides to any story. And we, we kind of, we need to remember that always. So, and that I think will help breed compassion for, for people. And the last sort of thing that I think stems from that. So it's like this trickle down effect, um, is it's not, we actually suck at this last one at listening, but I think if we can, if we can improve our listening skills and, and take a moment to listen to your fellow human being, it changes everything. Um, when we can do that better. And so these are the kind of roots at this stage in my life that I think are ridiculously human. And I think it might change as we go, but I think that's where it is right now. Best answer, my man. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> I to say that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was an amazing Thanks, answer, man. man. Definitely. Thanks, bud. <laughs> so, bud, um, I just want to say like a massive thank you uh, for, for so many things, but it's been an amazing six years friendship. You know, I, I just flip and I love you so much. I can't begin to explain to you like how much I look forward to every single morning <laughs> to turning on my phone. And the only thing that, that I turn on in the morning is, is WhatsApp. And I know that five mornings out of seven, I'm probably <laughs> going to have at least a five to 10 minutes audio message to listen to. <laughs> and it doesn't matter what sort of mood I'm in or mindset I'm in. I know that by the end of that chat, or so even within the first two seconds after I hear the <laughs> woohoo, <laughs> that uh, I'm going to have a smile on my face. And um, it's become such a big part of my day. And, uh, you know, I don't know what I would do if, if I didn't have that, <laughs> to, be, to be totally honest with you. Um, but, but firstly, thanks for putting in so much effort. Firstly, when it comes to this storyboard that you did for this conversation, because it really got to help me understand you on a, on a deeper level. And, and I, you, you, I know you, you're very smart in, in how you did it because you're like, okay, cool. If I do this, then he's also going to have to do this. And I think that's really, really clever. Um, but it's also helped me just respect you on a, on a much deeper layer. Um, but also of course, understand you on a, on a much deeper layer and also feel more connected to you because, but honestly, like I wrote to you in the reply <laughs> emails, like thanks for writing out the first bit of my um, storyboard too, because I, there's so much similarities there and it's, it's quite scary in a way, like, you know, and, and when, and, listening to you speak has, has reminded me about so many things as well, which have just sort of come up in my childhood. And, <laughs> and I actually spent quite a bit of time in PE as a youngster because uh, my dad worked there for a while huh. um, and I'd go and stay there for him like, with him for like, I didn't even know that. Time. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Like, and I know you just kind of, <laughs> I remember, I knew of course, but now like I remembered it again. I was like, I wonder if we were ever on this, the beach at the same time together <laughs> as youngsters or whatever, Probably. you know what I mean? Um, so, but just, yeah, thank you for the friendship, man. Um, thank you for, of course, for sharing the story. Uh, first of all, once again, uh, I'm mesmerized by, by how you speak. You speak really, really, really well, bud. And I can just see you on stage uh, doing this more in the future and inspiring others to be the, be the same. And to see the change in you is, is huge as a person. And the leadership qualities that you have in you are immense, bud. And, and it's just like, 
I feel so proud to have you as like an ambassador that we're doing this thing together. Um, it, it means more to me than, than anything in the entire world. And it's just special, but it's just special. And, and what you've done in your life and the way you've touched people and the way you interact with people uh, makes me super proud as a buddy. Like I can't explain to you, you know, we, we, of course we speak about this all the time, but you know, just how you touch people and how you interact with people makes them want to gravitate towards you and, and be part of who you are and feed off you and learn from you and stuff. And that's exactly how I feel as a mate as well. Thanks, and man. it's just been, it's been a, an amazing time. And I, I really, but I can't wait for what the future holds for, for us as a podcast and us as a, as a friendship, you know, and I, I really long for being closer together in some sort of capacity, yeah. e even if it's not, we don't live in the same country, but we have, I don't know, weeks or, or months that we're able to spend with each other yeah. and, uh, you know, and yeah, just grow older together. And for sure, um, man. You know what I mean? Like all those times we've caught up in our lives, like in person, have just been epic on like epic. other levels, like just total fun. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say, man, you, you, you totally are my, my brother from another mother. There's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, your mom's name is Carol. My mom's name is Caroline. Like there's, there's just, your mom's a grandma Nazi. My mom's a grandma Nazi. Yeah, like, totally. <laughs> there's just, there's just so much, so much there, but so, oh, Thanks for telling your story, bud. You're a super inspirational guy. Um, and I'm just massively proud to, to be on this journey with you. And I love you like a brother. And um, thanks for being such an amazing bloke. Yes, Gareth. Well, listen, thank you. I don't even know where to begin. First of all, thank you so much for that. For that. I mean, if I'm ever having a down moment, I'm going to listen to that again. Uh, I appreciate your, your honest words. I know that's coming from an honest place and I, it means it's, I can't even tell you how much that means to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, it's a great initiative, a great idea. Um, and I feel as, as one does more connected to you and to everyone now that everyone knows everything, you know what I mean? I, it's, yeah. it's a great thing to do. And, and I, and I'm grateful to you for, for giving me the space to, uh, to be open and honest with you, you know, and not being, not in a judgmental space. So I really do appreciate that. I, yeah, I mean, you as a mate, I'm not going to get into that too much now. I'll, I'll speak to you when we, when we do your one, but, um, love you, my man. Thank you for being literally the rock all the time and more and more in my life as a whole. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. So thanks for this. And thank you for everyone listening to this long chat about all about me, which is not nat a natural thing, but I really do appreciate all of you coming on this journey with me and us. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to interact more with all of you after you now know everything about me. So thanks once again, buddy. Awesome, bud. Thanks, my man. Woo. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> well done my man that was amazing Thanks, man. That was good really job good. my man well done uh it's a long one jesus but it was so good it was so like... flipping good trust me thanks my man thanks for being such a good interviewer man you're a flipping great interviewer bud no worries man no you i'm serious made bud. It easy, bud. you made it easy no really but no no it's it's a flipping skill you have eh? you're gonna flipping you're a machine seriously no, but it was, it, you made it flipping easy. Trust me, but it was, uh, it was easy to speak to you. <laughs> like, you know, you just like, um, spoke just enough. You know what I mean? Like it was, a, it's a proper skill, but, and, and, and it was, it was flipping cool, but so cool. thanks, man. I thought I'd went on a bit long at times, but, but oh, not at all, but honestly, not, not, okay. not one little bit. Like I would be like, I would, I would edit nothing out of that besides okay. you, you know, his ums and ahs for both of us. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Thanks for that, but you were real. Um, and really thanks for those amazing words. Like I, that, that means so much to me, man. And, uh, yeah, that for me, like just hearing you say those things is worth all of this amazing stuff that we're doing. So thank you, but it's oh, bud. very special to me, but seriously. 
Pleasure, and I feel man. exactly the same way as you know, obviously. No, I, I know, but yeah, yeah, you didn't. Thanks, I was like, yeah, uh, I totally know, but so it's, <laughs> it's awesome, man. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold mountain range. Gotta be quick.